Something for everyone in the August jobs report with the top line beating estimates, but the unemployment rate ticking higher and European inflation hits a record high. This is Wall Street Week. This week, Wall Street Week contributor Larry Summers on the jobs report. People have a tendency to exaggerate how much favorable participation contributes to necessary disinflation. And Jessica Caldwell of Edmonds on the future of the electric vehicle market. It finally feels like now we're kind of on the cusp of something big. So I think the question here is, are consumers ready to pony up to spend the money? Markets began the week jittery following Fed Chair Powell's hawkish tilt from Friday, with Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari hammering the point home. I was actually happy to see how Chair Powell's Jackson Hole speech was received. You know, people now understand the seriousness of our commitment to getting inflation back down to 2%. Inflation in Europe rocketed to yet another all-time high, reaching 9.1% year over year, as the bloc's central bank weighs whether to go with a jumbo rate hike of 75 basis points. But economists are also being swayed because of all this hawkish commentary we've had out of the ECB. You've had six members of the governing council now saying that a move bigger than a half point needs to be at least considered. Plus, natural gas prices in Europe continue to fall throughout the week, even as Russia's Gazprom shut off the spigots to Germany's Nord Stream pipeline. Three days of maintenance. I, I put quote marks around that because some people doubt the motives behind that. I'm Caroline Hyde alongside Matt Miller. Let us shape up the week for you, the week that was on Wall Street. S&P 500, five days, we're in the red to the tune of almost well, three and a half percent. This is the th third straight week of losses. This is the worst week we've had since mid-June. Two-year yield, almost in a round trip. Look, we're basically flat on the week, but what a movement, intra-week volatility that we had. Yields rise, we think that we have a hawkish Fed on our hands. They pull back when we get a really rather Goldilocks scenario with the jobs data. And Matt, the VIX, it creeps a little high, but look, 25 is above the yeah. annual average. Yeah, I think the VIX doesn't really do much. So um, I'm not convinced that we're really headed down hard yet. The market doesn't really believe that the Fed can go ahead with rate hike after rate hike after rate hike. They're a little more convinced after Jackson Hole. Mm -hmm. But this jobs number, you were talking about this earlier today, um, we saw what looked like maybe a little stabilization in terms of average hourly earnings, and we saw the participation rate climb. So, you know, that's uh, putting in a couple more question marks over the Fed's commitment to raise rates. Soft landing, can they do it? Let's ask our guests. We're pleased to welcome to the show Ellen Lee, Director and Fundamental Portfolio Manager for Causeway Capital, Sonal Desai, Chief Investment Officer, Franklin Templeton, Fixed Income, it is wonderful to have you both here as we look towards a long weekend, a long weekend where it felt that money managers took risk off the table. Ellen, start first and foremost with us, your interpretation of the jobs number and where that leaves the Federal Reserve. I think, you know, people are looking at the number very carefully to see if what feds are doing is working, to see if this, what actions they've taken are loosening the labor market. It doesn't, it, there's incremental signs, but nothing for sure. And I think there is also some confusion in the market thinking that, you know, only from the unemployment numbers, we will see a, a slowdown be more market. But in a high inflationary era, it is common that labor market stays tight before the shoe really drops. So I know this is a number that the Fed is concerned about, but we have way more to go before unemployment is threatening, where Fed has to reverse course. We had, you know, in the last trading day of the week, a big turnaround, as Caroline points out. Of course, a lot of asset managers are going to take risk off the table as they go into a Labor Day weekend. You don't want to be sitting on the beach worried about your portfolio. Chanel Desai, you have a big portfolio to worry about. Is that what you guys have done at the end of the week? Do you see um, portfolio managers typically doing that? So, you know, Matt, I, I'd actually take it back to what you started uh, started discussing. The Fed lacks credibility. Mm -hmm. Markets don't believe that the Fed is going to do what the Fed keeps saying it's going to do. That's a problem for the Fed, and it's also a problem for markets. So we, in our portfolios, have actually, we, we started taking risk off sometime before 
this long weekend. We don't think that a long weekend in and of itself makes a major difference. I couldn't agree more with Ellen. This is one data point. The bottom line is I'm going to be looking very carefully at the Fed's new SEPs to see if we get some more realistic SEPs after the March and June, num uh, yeah. June projections, which I didn't think were internally consistent at all. So, I, I want to dig in yeah. there for a moment, Sonal, because you're saying they lack credibility. You are a bond money manager, first and foremost, fixed yeah. income. It felt as though the bond market sort of had interpreted the Federal Reserve along the right tracks prior to Jackson Hole. They didn't expect to pivot in quite the same way that the equity market did. Why do you think, therefore, credibility has been so hard to come about? So actually, I'm not sure I fully agree with you because mm. we were at 347, the type of volatility we've seen in the bond market on every single uh, data point to me indicates that the bond market also fully anticipates that the Fed is going to do what it's done for the better part of a couple of decades now, which is as soon as the market gets wobbly, the Fed blinks and it reverses course. It happened in 2018. People keep anticipating that the, fir the Fed's first and foremost view, the first target, the only target, is unemployment and growth. When we've got inflation at 8.5% and we have employment significantly lower than current Nairu, it seems remarkable because the Fed is beating one of its targets. It's knocking it out of the ballpark as far as uh, yeah. unemployment is concerned. And it's completely blowing the other target and has yeah. been now. Uh, by the, and by the way, Nairu or Nehru, yeah. the, uh, what is it, yeah. non-accelerating inflation, inflation rate of unemployment. Employment, we, we, got yeah. Larry, we got Larry Summers' take on that, which we're going to play out later. He says it's like five, five and a half percent. I would agree. So, Totally yeah, agree. We're nowhere near that. But I want to no get to something that I think is really interesting. And, um, you know, Ellen, with your work into consumers, um, with your previous work in transportation and autos, I see this real divergence, or some of my favorite words now, bifurcation, dichotomy, mm -hmm. in terms of the market doesn't seem to believe the Fed, but consumers seem to for sure, mm -hmm. right? They're freaked out about getting low rates locked in on mortgages, getting a lower rate before they go and buy a car as those continue to climb higher and higher. How do you see the consumer right now, Ellen? Well, consumer, I love that word bifurcation because I feel like it's the word for 2022. You know, after what's happened after COVID, you see consumers, you know, spending a lot on services, sort of a revenge uh, spending, yeah. but so they are really taking back spending on discretionary. And, you know, the goods side of consumer sentiment is really low. And you also see retailers already coming out saying they have bloated inventories. So consumers are waiting for deals. There's going to be negative earnings revisions on the consumer discretionary stocks. And we're just waiting for the shoe to drop. And again, I agree with Sanal. The equity market, you know, the the tear it went on in July and August, it clearly indicated that they believed that Fed was going to blink. And I think this is why mm. Jerome Powell had to use that strong yeah. language in the recent meeting to say, you know what, 8% inflation is not acceptable. So now and you know what's really fascinating? That speech, Ellen, that he gave at Jackson Hole, it's a speech he should have given six months ago, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> a year I mean, ago at the heart. Uh, yeah, a year ago. If we, I've been crying for this for a couple of years now because I really think that uh, the delay uh, is going to make this more painful. Yeah. And in part, it's because the Fed has to follow through. So I keep seeing everybody obsessed with, OK, today's jobs number. Does that mean mm -hmm. 75? Does it mean 50? Does it mean 75? We're all macro matter. tourists now. It <laughs> doesn't even matter because the bottom line is, I think what I really need to see in the SEPs is internal in, uh, internal consistency, potentially a higher peak Fed mm -hmm. funds rate. Remind us what the SEPs <laughs> are, um, Chanel. These Sorry, are the, the projections the, from the Fed. The, those are the project uh, uh, projections, the economic projections which the Fed does every quarter, which will come out again in September. And this is, these are forecasts, median forecasts of all the uh, FOMC members, including of GDP, unemployment, inflation, and uh, importantly, you also see the median Fed funds rate. Yeah. Now, the ones which we saw from March and June had a Fed funds peaking at 3.8, I think, already in June. But this went together with unemployment, which remained at around 3.7 or 3.8. Yeah, yeah. And uh, markets basically said, well, that isn't internally consistent. I think we actually are going to see, we need to see Fed funds above four, and we need to see the Fed project a higher unemployment rate, yes. lower GDP growth, 
and that somewhat sticky inflation to make this whole thing hang together, They're if still, this makes sense. Uh, still, yeah. maybe trying so to that's what, highlight yeah. a soft landing or the wish that was. So now, just very briefly, <laughs> got about a minute left. Let's, in our first part of this conversation, you said perhaps there's more pain to come. Look, there has been evident pain in the market you look at first and foremost. Yeah. I mean, Matt's been shining light on it all day. The ag index, the global bond market, yeah. is now back in bear market territory. We've seen, as you mentioned, the volatility in the bond market, the move index has been at such elevated levels versus the VIX. How much more painful can this get in your part of the market? So I think that actually you're going to continue to see volatility until markets internalize what different central banks are going to do. Look, the exit from this quantity of QE and market distortion that we have seen over the last, basically since the global financial crisis, so we're soon going to be coming up for 15 years, anybody who thought that the exit would be simple uh, was dreaming, really. It's going to, it was always going to be a complicated thing, and I think it's going to be extremely complicated. And uh, the fact that we've got these issues with oil and commodities and supply chain bottlenecks, it's... It just adds. There's the, there's the global ag right there. Um, you can see it on your Bloomberg by typing I N go, and it's down 20%. When we come back, I want to ask about this really an historic move in bond markets, certainly when uh, compared with what's happened in equity markets. We're going to have much more with Shnada Sai and Ellen Lee. Ellen's going to give us some individual company names to talk about after we take a break. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This week, the conventional media began to catch up. After all, it was hard totally to ignore such additional developments as the slowest rate of manufacturing growth in 13 months, the first outright decline in construction spending in seven months, falling prices for raw materials to the lowest level since September, the biggest monthly tumble in factory orders in almost a decade, a rising unemployment rate, and the first monthly decline in private sector jobs in more than four years. You think maybe the economy really is a hair less vibrant these days? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm Matt Miller alongside Caroline Hyde. That clip of Louis Rukeyser from June 2nd, 2000, when Santana's Maria Maria was at the top of the charts and Mission Impossible 2 was the number one movie of the land. There were similarities between the economy then and now. The unemployment rate ticked up, but back then it was all the way to 4% compared to this month's 3.7%. And people were starting to really think about what was going on in the economy rather than at the individual company level. Ellen Lee joins us right now with Chanel Desai. They're back with us to continue this conversation. Ellen, I wanted to touch on this because it seems like the whole world's gone macro. Everybody wants to talk about the unemployment rate and the Fed, um, inflation. How does that strike you as, as a fundamental research analyst? I, I can't ignore what's happening in the world, obviously, because it's the backdrop for the environment in which companies operate. But at Causeway, we're looking for bottom-up you know, investment ideas. And there are a couple that I really like in this environment. You know, Philips and Alstom both are restructuring stories, trading at 10 times. I think in the current environment where interest rates are going up, I think that's a good tailwind for value stocks. But more importantly, they have more have their fate in their control of where the management can lead them out of the situation they're in. And of course, macro environment being challenging, we believe is all reflected in their valuation. Philips, Alstom, both being European companies. And Philips, we know for, well, you might use them for your toothbrush, for example. So now, you're, you're a global perspective here. It, we look towards mm -hmm. next week. We look towards the European Central Bank. It, Fed is not the only central bank having to fight inflation here. It's certainly not. And really, the PBOC is the only one who doesn't. And your perspective on whether Europe is in a place to be investing at the moment? I think you're right. in a very lot Sorry. Because... Sorry, one moment, Ellen. I just just to okay. now for a second. Oh, sorry. sorry. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't hear that. So I was just going to say that uh, Europe's in a very different position yeah, relative to the US. I would say that uh, it's 
interesting that inflation is almost as, you know, is, is very similarly high in Europe as it is in the U.S., when it comes from completely different fundamental characteristics. You had energy prices go up six. Uh, that I think energy prices in Europe, gas prices, for example, went up there's six, seven, ten times more yeah. than they went up here in the US. So yes, you've got inflation, but it's very different. The drivers are different. The demand side for Europe is significantly different than the demand side we had here in the US. This is why and I so think this is why I think Ellen's call for Phillips and Alstom is so interesting. I mean, um, the Russians said late on Friday that they are not going to reopen the spigots in terms of Nord Stream 1. Caroline was uh, anchoring the close on Bloomberg, and all of a sudden, the markets turned around bigly. Ellen, why would you want two industrials in Europe at a time when they can't even count on energy bills to stay as low as 10 times as high as what we pay in the U.S.? Because you have to look at the price on the screen. These stocks are down more than 50%. And they're reflecting this challenging operating environment. But mind you, you know, this gas crisis right now, this winter, it's going to be difficult. Actually, people are thinking about a more difficult winter the year after. But the yeah. reality is things are in motion where this is going to be resolved. And guess what? In the long term, everybody's going off Russian gas. Mm. I mean, Sonal, this is your sweet spot. We all know, of course, the Franklin Templetons of this world for emerging market expertise, but also global expertise. And therefore, are there any emerging markets at this moment that look in any way attractive when you've got the US dollar, as it did this week, hitting a new record high? So I think that you've got to look at uh, different elements, whether you're looking at local currency, whether you're looking at hard currency. Certainly, uh, in our emerging market debt opportunities fund, we continue to find opportunities in the hard currency space in particular. I would note, though, that as these valuations get more attractive, there is a tendency to throw everything out. And there are many emerging markets which continue to have very solid policies, number one. Number two, when you have energy crises the way we currently have, unsurprisingly, you still have a large number of emerging markets, not not just Russia, <laughs> many other emerging markets, which actually stand to benefit from high energy prices. And uh, I would note that while commodity prices, such as food prices, have come down, there's every expectation that these are going to go up and they're going to come down. And so there are emerging markets which benefit from a lot of these underlying uh, features, I by would say. By the way, Chanel, Ellen makes a, an interesting point, which I want to get your take on. This winter is going to be hard. Next winter could be worse, right? We've yeah. seen forecasts for inflation in the UK, for example, of over 22% from reputable investment banks. I mean, how quickly do the central banks want to get a handle on inflation? Because if they want to do it quickly, they're going to have to come down hard, like Paul Volcker hard, on labor markets. And that's going to cause widespread pain and maybe civil unrest. And it's going to be politically maybe untenable. So it's going to be really hard. There's no easy way to put this. I don't think those massive double-digit uh, inflation rates are necessarily going to happen in all of Europe, and that's a different issue. The UK, in many respects, always seems to have some more tailwinds on inflation than the, list, than the rest of Europe does, though all of it is very high. The problem is that if you let that high inflation continue, mm -hmm. inevitably, it starts getting built into expectations, wage expectations, and it just gets harder the longer you wait. Yeah. So it's not clear to me that uh, central banks have much of an option, right? They don't have an easy way out. And yes, it's going to be extremely painful. And actually, I think that Andrew Bailey... I mean, monetary policy was way too easy for way too long. And it feels <laughs> and like so Andrew Bailey policy. called that a little bit at the UK, and he started talking tough, perhaps, before, before the market had anticipated. What about Christine Lagarde, then, for Ellen? What about next week? What about 75 basis points? I mean, I think, you know, overall inflation is high, so the central banks need to do what they need to do. But again, I would agree with Sanal. The energy crisis is at the sort of center of inflation. And because of that, we see governments in Germany, France, and UK discussing and thinking about how they can manage power prices because they can change the structure of the market to ensure that this can be more contained. And I think there's more news to come. And I think this is why when the pipeline shut down, actually gas prices fell. Ellen, 
We haven't really gotten to China yet. And you cut your teeth in Hong Kong, I believe, at Credit Suisse before working for Tiger Asia. Um, what do you make of the lockdown of Chengdu? I mean, 21 million people, almost as many people as live in Australia, right, in this one city. Um, we've seen this in other mega cities, and it's just leading to really slow growth. What, the forecast, like three and a half, three percent now, way below what they need to do. How does that uh, fit into your bottoms up research on these um, industrial companies? So um, it's like a broken record, these lockdowns, right? But what we're seeing is when I'm looking at companies bottom up, there is this pattern of earnings that is going to really deviate from past history. So we could get seasonality based on lockdowns. If I look at consumer discretionary stocks, depending on when the lockdowns happen and when it opens up, there is a revenge expenditure that happens. Mm. So we're really going to have to adjust for those lockdown scenarios and how it affects the earnings number. But so far, at least on the consumer side, things have been resilient, but I'm not so sure going forward mm -hmm. as PMIs are dropping. And of course, spending and your can time. Can I actually yeah. just add very quickly to what Ellen said, the global implication of China's lockdowns, the complete lockdowns, which are not predictable by definition, that has additional inflationary impact, right? Because you can't predict when you're going to have additional supply chain bottlenecks. It just makes it very difficult not to raise rates and not to try and keep a lid on some of this. Love that perspective. One, one word answer for you, Sonal. Is China investable or not? Pass, because it's, it's, there's no one <laughs> word answer. It depends on the company. It depends on the sector. Yeah. It depends on what you're investing in. I, so truly, it's two, 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 two words. It depends. <laughs> Perfect. Ellen, Lee, Sonal Desai, wonderful to have time with you. We want to thank you both for joining us on Wall Street Week. And of course, coming up, we're going to have so much more of a global perspective for you. It is global Wall Street. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. I'm Juliette Sali in Singapore. This week in Asia, China likely to report slower export growth and softer consumer and factory gate prices, more signs of weakening demand. Meanwhile, central banks in Australia and Malaysia are likely to hike rates again to quash rising inflation. Meanwhile, in Japan, gains in household spending will probably have accelerated due to busy summer travel. And inflation data from Thailand and the Philippines will likely show steeper increases in the cost of living. The main event in Europe in the upcoming week will be the ECB decision on Thursday. The current market pricing is coalescing around 75 basis points after earlier last week seeing record inflation for the Eurozone coming in at 9.1% for the month of August. Adding to that, plenty of hawkish ECB members pushing 95 basis points worth of hikes. Now, any language around QT will also be watched if that's accelerated following accelerated rate hikes. But of course, complicating the matter is an expected recession in the region with the energy crisis gripping Europe. On the heels of the payroll report, both Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen are due to speak. Meanwhile, regional Fed governors of the Chicago, Minneapolis and Kansas City Fed will also make comments alongside Fed Vice Chair Lael Brainerd. Congress starts to return from its summer recess as President Biden attends the groundbreaking of a new Intel facility in Ohio. Chips and supply chain issues are likely to be in focus for Washington. In corporate news, Apple is expected to unveil the iPhone 14 lineup and its next slate of smartwatches as the company faces a slowdown in consumer spending and looks to shift its supply chain. On the earnings front, GameStop, Zscaler, DocuSign, and Kroger are all due to report quarterly results. I'm Kriti Gupta. You're watching Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Welcome back to Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. I'm Matt Miller. California has taken a big step forward in the electric car revolution, banning the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles in the state by 2035. So what do investors need to know about how this will affect the industry? For more, let's go to Jessica Caldwell. She is executive director for Insights with Edmonds. Jessica, thanks so much for joining us. Um, let's first talk about the state of the market. I mean, 
we have been seeing so many Teslas on the road, certainly where you are, for years and years, and everyone's talking about the new Ford Lightning, as well as a number of other startup electric car companies like Lucid, for example. But how much of the market really is electric right now? Across the United States, it's not a big percentage. If you look at battery EV sales this year, they're around 5% of pure EVs. So not a big percentage. And this is a technology we've been talking about for over a decade, we've seen these cars. But it finally feels like now we're kind of on the cusp of something big. We don't know exactly what the effect of that is yet, but it definitely feels like the products are finally coming. So I think the question here is, are consumers ready to pony up and spend the money? We know the past few years have been quite difficult in that regard. And to kind of see if the infrastructure will support increased sales. But if we look at the market as it is, it's still a very small percentage of total new vehicle sales. In terms of spending the money, we've started to see price increases, right? Ford is raising prices for the Mach-E. It's already raised prices um, for the Lightning and not unsubstantial amounts. We're talking about three, four, seven eight thousand dollar price increases these vehicles i think uh, at least the smaller ones were affordable before but the bigger ones like the trucks can get up to a hundred thousand dollars are they making any margin on those yes i mean i think that's what it's all about really i mean there's been so much demand for these vehicles this year i mean i don't even think you can get on a reservation list right now for a lightning so if you really want one it's 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 pretty hard out there so i think they're probably responding to the demand that they see. I mean, we've seen a lot of price increases also for Tesla products over the course of the past year and just the market in general. I mean, if we look at new vehicle prices, they really have skyrocketed. I mean, the average new vehicle is about $47,000 right now, which feels much higher than it ever has been historically. And new EVs are over $60,000. So it is not a, a cheap game to, to buy a new vehicle, uh, particularly an EV. Fortunately for now, you get $7,500 back from Uncle Sam, and a lot of uh, local markets also give you some sort of tax rebate. How long is that going to last? I mean, I've heard that um, starting next year, you're going to have to buy cars that are made in America in order to get that, and that you're going to have to buy cars that have battery components also made in America. Yes, next year is where it starts to get really tricky because not only are there requirements for the vehicles themselves and their components like their battery, um, the battery elements, as well as where the vehicle is assembled, there's also requirements on income levels. So if you're someone that is, you know, you're a married couple and you make over $300,000, which may seem like a lot of money, but if you think about these vehicles are $100,000, it's it, it really isn't you're not going to be eligible for those rebates, which is, you know, a bit difficult. And the same thing for the used vehicles. So that's what's interesting and new is that in uh, we're going to start seeing used rebates for EVs, about $4,000, again, income requirements. So all of a sudden, this, this market, which didn't really have too many rules in terms of the rebates, is going to get really strict. And it's going to be pretty hard to figure out if your vehicle qualifies. Um, there's going to have to be VIN decoders to figure out if your vehicle has the battery, the battery components, and the vehicles. Automakers have a few years to ramp up to get these things set in place. Obviously, this cannot change overnight, but it's still going to be a tough challenge for them as well as consumers. Yeah, because as of right now, none of the electric vehicles comply with the new regulations in terms of, you know, the raw materials um, coming from the U.S. or the batteries being built in the U.S., um, they're going to have to change that. Are they, do you think, those companies building car, car, electric cars in the U.S., like GM, like Ford, like BMW, are they going to have to revamp the way they source these materials? Yes, a lot of the companies, there's a lot of pressure on them to revamp the where, where they source these materials. I mean, we know that there's a lot of factories being built as we speak or vac factories of building factories very soon so that's definitely something that's in play but in terms of sourcing some of these minerals um, the mining that goes into it that's a, a little bit different that's something that takes from what i understand a very long period of time you can't just change that overnight i mean none of these things you can really change overnight but that is even more sensitive to to time so yes in terms of where they get these natural resources, they're going to have to put a lot more effort into it, which is tough. I mean, it's not, they don't have to be 100% next year. There is a time frame associated with it. It's like 40%, 60%, 100% eventually. So they do have a bit of a time window, but 
that seems like that is going to be quite challenging and not something that they would have absolute control over. I mean, automakers, their specialty is designing, building vehicles, not necessarily figuring out where these resources come from and sourcing them and, and doing everything that involves. That That's that's definitely adding a challenge to what is already a challenging scenario. Let's talk about, Jessica, the players here. I mean, Tesla seems to have an advantage still in terms of the range. I guess that's the battery uh, plus the software. But how long do they hold on to that? It's going to be challenging for Tesla to hold on because they kind of have been this big fish in a small pond for a very long period of time. They have the cool brand factor, which you cannot underestimate, but as we know, that doesn't last forever. And all of a sudden, we have a lot of competitors that are finally getting serious and making cool cars. I mean, even somebody like Hyundai with their Ionic 5. We see Tesla shoppers looking also at, at Hyundai. And what world did that seem like that was going to happen a few <laughs> years ago True. in terms of brand? And we see that now. So... I think that they're still going to be fine. Um, they're, they're still going to make a lot of cars, sell a lot of cars. But in terms of their market share of the EV market, of course, that's going to slip tremendously over the course of the next decade. Who would have guessed 10 years ago that everybody would want a Kia Telluride? Um, but they're <laughs> pretty awesome. Uh, in, in terms of the incumbents, you know, GM has the Bolt, plus they've brought out the Hummer, kind of a barbell strategy there. They're coming out in, in the middle with... Um, other offerings, the Silverado EV is one I'm looking forward to. Ford, of course, has the Mach-E, and they've got the Lightning, which is probably the most talked about electric car since a Tesla. BMW has uh, some exciting products. Dodge even announced a new, I think, Challenger that's going to be um, electric. Which one do you think is going to lead the charge as this ramps up? I think initially, because they've spoken the most about it, they have the platform, the Altium, Altium platform. I think GM is sitting in a good place. We, They're very upfront about the vehicles. We know that there's a Blazer, an Equinox that is supposedly coming out for $30,000, which can really change the market a lot if they can get to volumes. We know the Silverado's coming, the Cadillac Lyric, even the Celestic, a bit expensive, but it's going to create some excitement. So I feel like they have talked the most about building high volume vehicles at lower price points, which is what this market means. Some of the other automakers, they have you know some really cool cars and cool concepts, but I feel like GM is probably hitting volume niches at this point a bit better than the others. What about the uh, startups, Jessica, especially companies that seem to be um, struggling to produce um, the kind of the kind of uh, quantities that are necessary to to stay in this industry? Um, which ones do you think will survive? That's a tough question. I think all of them are a bit tenuous, to, to be honest, just because we know that it's challenging for these automakers that have been around for decades, if not you know over 100 years making cars, to, to operate in this environment, to change, especially in light of some of the new uh, you know requirements on uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act. That's going to be tough for these established automakers that have very deep supply chains, relationships, all those things needed to make this work successfully. So some of these new players, um, I think that it's hard for them to be in volume. Um, I think that's gonna be the struggle. Even someone like Rivian, who product is cool, can't fault that, love the vehicles, but even competing against a GM and Ford at what they can offer in terms of price points is gonna be tough. So they're gonna have to rely a lot on brand, being new, being fresh, somebody like VinFast as well, kind of having a, you know, a different spin to the market, which will appeal to a certain sector. I just think it's hard to get to volumes with those type of plays. Right. They've got to actually deliver the product. And if you want uh, Lucid or if you want a Bollinger or a Canoe, you're going to have to wait a long time, if not forever. The Cybertruck is one. I know people have been waiting years for this to come out. Is it ever really going to come from Tesla? Who knows? I mean, yes, I feel like we've seen this ages ago. It was like anything that happened pre-pandemic feels like it was 100 years ago. Um, and that was certainly in this category. I think eventually, I mean, it's probably hard for Tesla to prioritize considering there is so much demand on their other product. I, I, I just don't know what, why maybe you put the resources into that if you can barely kind of keep up with what you have. I think more importantly, they probably have to work on refreshes on some of the existing models like the Model 3, the Model S, pretty long in tooth at this point. Mm. Um, but I, I do think the Cybertruck will eventually come. Not sure if it's going to be an exact model that we, we saw uh, Elon drive around and try to crush the doors in, um, but it feels like it will come. I just... I mean, honestly, who knows when, though? Hopefully they it's get those windows fixed. Jessica, thanks so much for joining us. Jessica Caldwell there from Edmonds talking to us about the race to win um, the electric car crown.
Coming up, we wrap up the week with former U.S. Treasury Secretary and Wall Street Week contributor Larry Summers. That's next on Wall Street Week. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Caroline Hyde, and we are thrilled, as always, as we do each week, to welcome our Wall Street Week special contributor, Harvard's Larry Summers. Of course, Larry, your reaction first and foremost with the jobs number, with actually a tick higher in participation, a steadying perhaps in terms of wage inflation. What do you make of the numbers? I think these numbers were relatively close to what we expected. I doubt anyone's going to change their view uh, radically on this. I think the increases in participation are good news, but I think there's a tendency to exaggerate how much higher participation will reduce inflation, because people think of it as extra labor supply, but they forget that if the unemployment rate rot stays the same and participation goes up, more people are working, earning, and therefore spending, and that in turn raises the demand uh, for labor. So I think this is a positive development for the economy, more people working, more GDP, but people have a tendency to exaggerate how much favorable participation contributes to uh, necessary disinflation. It doesn't the Fed, Larry, have to push people out of jobs? I mean, right now, everyone is earning money and able to pay up as much as they need to for goods and services. But um, in order to bring inflation down, they're going to need unemployment at four and a half, five, five and a half percent. I don't know what Nehru is right now, but maybe you have a view. Is that going to bring a political backlash? Uh, Matt, my guess is that uh, things are much less good than the Fed has uh, supposed. Uh, my estimate would be that the Nehru is now near five percent. I don't see how you can fail to think that the Nehru has risen substantially when you look at how much there's been an increase in vacancies at a given unemployment rate, what economists call the beverage curve, when you look at the big increases in quit rates uh, that we've seen, when you look at uh, wage uh, behavior. And I add all that up and I see a uh, difficult situation where I think that to start bringing down inflation, we're going to need to get wage. We're going to need to get above the Nehru. That's probably somewhere in the five percent uh, range, and I think we do have to achieve some meaningful amount of disinflation. So, I've said that I'd be surprised if we get to the six percent, get to the two percent inflation target, without an unemployment rate. Uh, that approaches or exceeds uh, six percent. And mm -hmm. I've said it before, I think the Fed's most recent judgment that they're going to get back to target with an unemployment rate that stays at 4.1 percent is certainly a possible outcome. But how that could be regarded as a most probable uh, outcome, I can't really understand. I think that's the quite optimistic case, nothing like uh, the most reasonable case. And I think that the preponderant probability is that the combination of 4 percent unemployment and 2 percent inflation, a misery index 4 plus 2 of 6, that the Fed foresees will be a substantial underestimate of where we'll be one year and two years from now. And to that end, therefore, Larry, when you looked at the JOLTS data, because it hasn't just been, of course, the non-farm payrolls, there's been a sprinkling of other data, whether we look at the new numbers coming from ADP, of course, whether it's the jobless claims that looked hot, you felt that really a soft landing was very hard to achieve. To that point, the market now thinking potentially a soft landing is achievable, you still think, no, not, not necessarily here? I, I don't think that we've seen a soft landing means disinflation with a strong economy. Evidence that we're having a strong economy without substantial disinflation doesn't really speak to the likelihood of a soft landing. So my view that a soft landing represents the triumph of hope over experience is not one that I'm changing uh, yet. It certainly could happen, but I think that one has to think in terms of preponderant probabilities. and. Uh, that's not the preponderant probability. 
Larry, I want to bring up um, the passing of Mikhail Gorbachev. You uh, served on the Council of Economic Advisors in Ronald Reagan's White House when, when those two made history together and really changed the trajectory of globalization, right? The fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union um, really brought the world closer together. Now Vladimir Putin um, is taking it in the other direction as Gorbachev dies. What are your thoughts on uh, the situation with Russia as it stands? And, and the legacy of Mikhail Gorbachev? I think in a quite extraordinary way, Mikhail Gorbachev will be remembered as a great historic figure for presiding over a great historic uh, surrender and letting that process play out without a massive loss of life. And I think that is, in its way, not the achievement he set out to achieve, but is, in its way, a uh, very substantial achievement. Look, I think we're at a time when globalization is getting a bad name. Uh, if you ask what the era of globalization has meant in terms of the quality of life for people around the world, in terms of the having of the share of children on our planet who die before the age of five, the doubling of the fraction of kids who learn uh, to read, the fact that for all our problems, the incidence of violent conflict on our planet is much lower than it was in the 1970s or uh, 1980s. The extraordinary change in human potential represented by the fact that there are now more smartphones on Earth than there are adults. And so the majority of the world's people can reach out uh, to all of the world's uh, other people. I think these are fantastic things. And yes, this is under attack. It is under attack from uh, Russia. It is under attack in important respects from an axis of authoritarians connecting Russia and China and Iran. And it is going to be the great struggle of our time to maintain the rule of law, to maintain openness, to maintain an a world of opportunity for as many people as possible. Yeah. But I think it's very much the wrong way to pursue a strategy of resisting uh, international connection rather than a strategy of better managing uh, international connection. I think there's nothing in history to suggest that a world of nations that isolate themselves is going to be an ultimately peaceful or prosperous or very attractive uh, world. Larry, talk to us, therefore. You mentioned China. And, of course, we got news this week the Communist Party will hold its 20th National Congress starting on October the 16th. China actually facing economically a rather different slate than the U.S., certainly the inflation not their first and foremost priority, but a property crisis and a COVID crisis. How do you out, what is your outlook on China as an economic uh, in growth fueling the rest of the world at the moment? Look, always a mistake to count China out after its remarkable performance over the last uh, 40 uh, years. They've shown themselves to be resilient and able to overcome uh, problems. But the problems look pretty deep, profound and severe uh, this time. Uh, I have learned over time to watch what happens to capital flows. And when a country's wealthy citizens are trying to take their money out, that's a time to be nervous about the near-term economic prospects for a country. And that certainly is the case in terms of what people are trying to do uh, in uh, China today. Uh, the date at which China will put COVID behind it seems to be a uh, receding uh, horizon. So I'd have to say that I view the situation in China with considerable anxiety. 
All right, Larry, thanks so much for joining us. Wall Street Week special contributor, of course, former Treasury Secretary and Harvard head Larry Summers there talking to us about uh, the jobs report, his outlook for central banks, and the geopolitical problems roiling uh, markets as well. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. We're in for David Weston, myself, Caroline Hyde, and Matt Miller. Finally, one more thought. Of course, we are about to experience Labor Day. What happens after Labor Day is everyone goes back to laboring. And in fact, Matt, they're going back to laboring perhaps in the office a little bit more. Yeah, a lot of them. Goldman Sachs, right? Morgan Stanley came out with notes, uh, memos to employees saying, hey, you know what? It's really time to come back. And don't worry about being vaccinated or taking a test. Just get back to the office, which I completely understand because if you're one of these banks' clients, you want them to be at work, right? You don't want them taking Labor Day are you off. Are trying to say that people are not productive when they're working at home? I'm not saying that, although um, I guess you could be doubtful if you're a client and you want to get your money's worth. You don't care as much if you're paying for their services about their work-life balance, right? What about you lawyers, though? Done. I feel like... Isn't it more the lawyers who are t charging you for every five minutes, ten minutes, who should be, therefore, seeing their seat uh, yeah. executives I mean, call them back? What did Shakespeare say? Um, the first thing we do is kill all the lawyers. I think that's <laughs> quite a different story than the bankers. But um, Love you, lawyers. I definitely understand uh, why these banks want their people back. And it's also about the I culture. Don't. I don't, Matt. Do you think that um, they can collaborate as well? Do you think that they can pass on knowledge from the senior bankers to the kids? Do you think that they need that five days a week? Yes. So I think... I mean, what, I want to point out that what I think doesn't matter. Yeah, but that is my me. opinion. That is my opinion, yeah. I quite... Jeffries, I thought, had a slightly more nuanced note. Clearly, they felt... I like the way that they sort of said it was in your lonely silos at home. I mean, anyone who has kids like we do or a dog or anything isn't as lonely as they'd like to be, I think. But there is that element of they're saying come back, but we're not clock watching you. We're not seeing when you're badging in or badging out. Just treat everyone like adults and decide to be in maybe three days a week on you certain collaborative that days. from Jeffries? I mean, they're so, pretty hardcore at Jeffries. I think they might be watching yeah, the CEO you. on the phone. Did you really mean Rich that? Rich Handler, yes, yeah. are you really not clock watching? <laughs> I mean, he probably has people that do it for him. But I think <laughs> it's about time for Wall Street really to get back to business, to get back to work the way they have been. It might not happen. What, for all the right MA away. that isn't happening because That's a very good point. costs are rising. Did you see Shanali Bassick sent us a note earlier showing that? Uh, M&A this year is a trillion dollars less than right. M&A at the same time last year. We've seen a ton of deals break apart and many, many more not even get done. So that's a very UBS, good point. Did you see UBS, Wellfront? That yes, deal has exactly. just untied itself. We exactly. saw Chobani, the yogurt makers, just put its IPO on ice. I feel that this and is Novogratz the And Novogratz isn't going to buy BitGo. I mean, there's a ton of deals that have fallen apart, but more and more haven't gotten done. Uh, to that note, mm -hmm. crypto... They're not going back to the office, and they yeah. seem to be relatively well, uh, Right. Uh, the West Coast, I mean, they're not going back to the office because they work from home or because they're getting fired, right? You're seeing big layoffs on uh, the West Coast, big layoffs in tech, and that's starting to spread across to industrial America with a 3M announcement. It's an optimistic way to leave it, isn't it? Yes. Well, have a great weekend. <laughs> Enjoy your Labor Day. You've been you watching. <laughs> we want to do it together. Wall Street, Street Week. Week. This, this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.